Hello, and welcome to EE for Everyone. Today we're going to talk about how to control the brightness of an LED. The brightness of an LED is controlled by how much power it's dissipating. A percentage of that power is converted into light, and the rest is converted into heat. Now you might be thinking, but I hook up an LED to my voltage source with a resistor and it turns on. Yes, that'll work, but there's something going on behind the scenes that you might not be aware of. On the screen, you will see a graph taken from the Cree XLAMP XPC LED datasheet. A link will be posted in the description of this video if you would like to take a closer look at this document. This is a graph of the luminous flux radiating from an LED due to an increasing forward current. Relative amount of luminous flux is another way of saying relative brightness. This graph is normalized to the quantity of light radiated from an LED when it's being driven by 350 milliamps of current. Because of this, and because of this graph, one might assume that the LED brightness is truly controlled by the quantity of current flowing through it, but I would disagree. A plot of relative LED brightness versus power will be almost perfectly linear throughout an LED's operating range. So if that's truly the case, why did the manufacturer provide the plot about current and not the plot about power? And also, why isn't this plot linear? Good questions. This plot isn't linear because a similar plot with respect to power would be linear, and this is a plot with respect to current. <clears throat> uh, what I meant to say is, this plot isn't linear because power is equal to the voltage times the current, and the forward voltage of an LED varies as current changes. This nonlinear variation of the LED forward voltage as current increases is what causes the nonlinearity you see here. What? Why are you giving me that cross-eyed, glossed over stare? What, you don't believe me? Fine, here's a plot of the forward current as forward voltage changes. If you were to flip the axes such that this plot were showing forward voltage plotted as forward current changes, you can see that the data plotted on this graph compared to the previous one has very similar slope. One might even say that if we multiplied the voltage and current at every point along the new curve, took that power and plotted it with respect to forward current, we would have the same graph that we started with but wasted half an hour in the process. Well, not exactly the same graph. If we took the power dissipated when 350 milliamps is flowing and called that 100% of the power flowing at 350 milliamps, then plotted all the other points as a percent of that power, then we would have the same graph. For those people in the world who want to fact check everything they hear, don't forget to convert milliamps to amps before multiplying to calculate power. If you're looking for an easy way to extract the data from the graph, I really enjoy using Webplot Digitizer. That's a tool you can use to extract data out of pictures of linear or log-log graphs. A link to that site will be in the description. So, why didn't the manufacturer provide a plot of LED brightness versus power? First of all, because that wouldn't be a very interesting graph, and secondly, because they usually provide it as a constant. This constant is labeled with the unit lumens per watt. A numeric constant with units like this is a simple way of sharing that information with us. Here's how to use one. If I put one watt of power into an LED rated as producing one lumen per watt, I will have one lumen of light created by the LED. If I were to do this for every point along that curve, you know, one watt, two watts, three watts, four watts, 149 watts, 150 watts, and plot the result, we would be left with a straight line. One could say that an equation is a way to represent a mathematical relationship, and a graph is another way to represent a mathematical relationship. Ultimately, the reason why the manufacturer didn't provide the LED brightness with respect to power is that controlling the power passing through an LED isn't as easy as controlling the current through the LED. That's because this would involve controlling the current through the LED as well as monitoring the forward voltage. Not to mention, the forward voltage is pretty constant as far as things that aren't constant go. 
the forward voltage varying from three to three and a half volts would change the power by about 16%. But since our eyes don't interpret light intensity linearly and don't interpret light at an identical intensity at a different color as the same brightness, we don't usually need absolutely perfect brightness control for an LED. If a person wanted to control the brightness approximately linearly from zero to 100% brightness and didn't require the accuracy that using power instead of current regulation would provide, current regulation is the next best thing. Ultimately, using current instead of power to linearly regulate the light output from an LED is close enough to linear that as a human observer, I would be hard pressed to notice the difference between a linear sweep from zero to 100% brightness and whatever the LED is actually doing when we regulate the current instead of power. Long story made short, the manufacturer of the LED understands that brightness is controlled by power, but recognizes that for most applications, an engineer will implement current control to achieve the brightness they desire either through a current limiting resistor or something more complicated. That's why they provided a graph of brightness of an LED with respect to forward current instead of with respect to power. Okay, before I waste all of our time making jokes and talking about things that don't matter for most applications, let's talk through a simple example of driving an LED. The schematic you see on screen is a voltage source driving an LED with a current limiting resistor. This circuit is meant to demonstrate how the forward voltage changes with forward current. How the voltage applied to the LED nearly does not change as we change the input voltage, and why a current limiting resistor is required in this situation. Let's start from square one, the voltage source. This is set up as a sine wave source with a DC offset varying from 5 volts to 10 volts. This is fed into our load which is the diode, D1, and the current limiting resistor, R1. Speaking of the current limiting resistor, let's look at how the current flowing through our current limiting resistor and how that is changing with the change in voltage. We know that the input voltage is increasing by a factor of two from maximum to minimum, five to 10 volts. So if the voltage across the LED was proportional to the input voltage, we would expect that the current would also vary by a factor of two. This is clearly not the case since the current is ranging from about 2.4 milliamps to 7.3 milliamps, meaning that the current is increasing by a factor of three, not two. This tells us something important, that as the input voltage increases, a larger percentage of that input voltage is dropped across the resistor. With this in mind, let's look at the voltage dropped across the LED, marked in our schematic as VLED. This appears to be a relatively constant voltage, near 2.6 volts. It's varying slightly with the changing input voltage. As you recall, I previously said that an LED is not controlled by voltage, but here I am talking about input voltage. How can we prove that this LED is responding to the current flowing through it? We can demonstrate this point by removing the current limiting resistor altogether and seeing what result that would have. Before we do, let's look at the voltages at the different nodes of this circuit after I zoom in on half of a period and add the voltage across R1. We can see the three lines across the screen, one representing the LED voltage, which is approximately constant at 2.6 volts, the increasing input voltage curve which is varying from five to 10 volts, and the voltage dropped across the current limiting resistor. Using Ohm's law at any point of time on this curve, if we take the input voltage, subtract the LED voltage, and divide that remaining voltage by the current limiting resistance, we would obtain the current passing through the LED at that point of time. So as we make the resistance value in that equation get smaller and smaller and smaller, the current at every point in time will increase and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So how large will the current through our LED be when the resistance is so close to zero 
that it's limited by the few tens of milliohms of a copper wire. That depends. In the real world, the voltage supply would likely be able to supply more current than our LED could handle, and the LED would immediately get destroyed. However, assuming that nothing was physically damaged by this excessive current flow, a lot of current would flow. Let's take a moment to explore exactly how much current that would be by changing our current limiting resistor to 10 milliohms. Since we're in LT spice, the LED won't be damaged. By plotting the current of the LED, we can see peaks near 8 amps of current, since we know the input voltage is 10 volts and nearly all of that voltage is dropping across the diode, this results in a peak power dissipation of 80 watts in the, in the junction of our diode. The junction inside of that LED won't stand a chance of surviving this kind of stress. So now we've seen how the LED responds to having a large resistance and how it responds to having a very small resistance for the current limiting resistor. But what if we want to drive an LED at a particular current, a more useful application? This is actually pretty easy with what we've already learned. Let's take our peak input voltage, 10 volts, and subtract the LED forward voltage, which we've just measured in our simulation is approximately 2.6 volts. This leaves 7.4 volts that will be dropped across the current limiting resistor. If we desire 333 milliamps of current flowing through the LED at a maximum, which leaves some room for derating on the 350 milliamp rating of this LED, we should divide 7.4 volts by 0.333 amps to get our result of 22.22 ohms. Let's call that 22 ohms. Setting R1 to 22 ohms and rerunning the simulation, this shows peaks of current near 310 milliamps, but that's not 333. So what's going on here? Well, since we're driving the LED at a higher forward current than before, the forward voltage of the LED isn't 2.6 volts anymore. By adding a plot of forward voltage, we can see that now the peak forward voltage is around 3.18 volts instead of 2.6. If we run through and recalculate what we just did with 3.18 volts for the forward voltage instead of 2.6, we will achieve a new resistance value of 20.48 ohms. Ignoring the fact that we would be very hard pressed to find a 20.48 ohm resistor specifically, let's use that value for now and rerun the simulation. Now we see our peaks of 333 milliamps, just as we would expect. Remember, this peak current of 333 milliamps through the LED was achieved using an approximated forward voltage that was measured at an operating point near our desired operating point. As a final point, let's consider the main reason why people desire LEDs, and that's their efficiency. In this configuration, with 10 volts applied and a 20 ohm resistor, this is not very efficient. I'll demonstrate this point by plotting the power dissipated in the LED, a percent of which is converted into light, and the power dissipated in the resistor. Since this will take a while, I'll cut away and come back. We can see that at best, about half of the power dissipated by this circuit is dissipated by the LED, which is plotted in blue. The power dissipated by the resistor is plotted in yellow. At worst, the resistor is burning up almost twice as much power as the LED. That means that at our desired set point of 333 milliamps, the LED is receiving one third of the power dissipated by this circuit. And then a percentage of that power is converted into light. That is awful efficiency, less than 33%. And there are so many more efficient ways to regulate the current through an LED than what is on the screen right now. Even optimizing what we have here would be able to achieve much better efficiency. We're going to revisit this topic in the coming videos, so stay tuned, 
We'll discuss a few ways to optimize the circuit you see on the screen and a few other approaches that you can use to regulate the current through an LED to maximize efficiency. You may be thinking to yourself, well, golly gee, that sounds great, but I don't like LEDs. I don't want to use LEDs. That's okay, because the same principle applies to bipolar junction transistors too. There is a forward bias diode when you apply voltage to the base of an NPN transistor. The main difference between the NPN transistor base emitter junction and this LED junction is that the forward voltage in this case is near 3 volts, but with the transistor that would be near 0.7 volts. The same principle applies though, without a resistor to limit the current going into the base of that transistor when it's connected to a voltage source, potentially destructive quantities of current would be allowed to flow. This same principle applies to optocouplers as well, which are truly constructed of a phototransistor and an LED in one package. When driving the LED half of an optocoupler, you must keep this concept in mind. Subtract the diode forward voltage from the supplied voltage and calculate the resistor value you require to achieve the correct current level. I hope that you enjoyed this video about LEDs and better understand why we need to use current limiting resistors to prevent damage to forward biased diodes, such as LEDs. I also hope that you understand that brightness of an LED is a function of power, and why regulating current instead of power is usually preferred for most applications. If you're really excited about my follow-up video about optimizing the efficiency of this circuit and alternative methods of controlling the current through an LED, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, subscribing to this channel, and leaving me a comment down below. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye!